So good evening, everybody. Uh, we start with the, the second lecture today, wherein we shall continue the basic general crystal chemistry that we were doing in the first class, and then we'll move on to certain new things as well today. Uh, before we start, if there is any doubt at all uh, from the previous class, uh, please type in the chat box, let me know, or else we can start with our uh, today's thing. So whenever you have the doubt, you can please uh, keep punching in. So every 15 minutes, when we'll take a two minutes break, we can go through go, uh, the chat box to see if you have any specific doubt or uh, clarity clarification required. Okay, so. We have students now with us. Okay. So last class uh, we finished on uh, what are the different AX kind of structures. Okay. Based on cubic close pattern to specify. So today starting with AX2 structure, AX, AX2 means your cation to anion stoichiometry is 1 is to 2. So what are the different AX2 kind of basic structures that we very generally come across? And uh, most of you would know. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, fluoride structure, antifluoride structure, which are of course nothing but the cation and anion exchanging uh, places. Talking about the antifluoride structure first, why we are talking about antifluoride structure first is because as I mentioned in the last class, we try to concentrate on the fact that we are making the close packing of anion and we try to fit in the cation, okay? And in antifluoride structure, going with the convention that we have followed in the previous class, your oxide makes the CCP or we also know the unit cell of CCP is face-centered cubic. So oxide makes the FCC and then sodium ion uh, occupies all the tetrahedral nodes. FCC of oxide means you have four oxide per unit cell and four oxide per unit cell means you have eight tetrahedral nodes. Now, if sodium is occupying all the tetrahedral hole that satisfy your stoichiometry of the compound, which is Na2O, okay? So, uh, I don't need to repeat oxide at the corners and the face centers and sodium ion at all the small octants that are present in the cube. Coordinate of the anion, we have done last time. Coordinate of the cations, we know what are the coordinates of tetrahedral hole. I can repeat it, but we have already done it last time. And I would urge you, this is not a very difficult thing. Whenever you're sitting uh, uh, just for five minutes or so, try to imagine what would be the coordinates of the tetrahedral hole, what would be the coordinates of the octahedral hole and the uh, your lattice ion. So, you know, that kind of, not just for particularly for this course, but it also clarifies a lot of concept because all of you, I believe are, uh, most of you are research scholars. So these are the things which you very frequently come across in the literature uh, paper. So it is good to have a clear idea of what I mean by what position do I mean by when I say one by four, one by four, three by four. Okay, just for that sake. Now again, coordination number of sodium. You can concentrate on the uh, your red ball, which is sodium in this particular structure. It is lying in the. Uh, uh, I think this is uh, mentioned wrongly here, okay? Uh, the coordination number of sodium is A because it is occupying all the tetrahedral, uh, sorry, this is right. Oxidation number of sodium is four because it is occupying all the tetrahedral hole. And how do I imagine the coordination number of oxygen? Uh, if you just concentrate of this uh, oxygen at the corner, okay? What happens is, it has this particular sodium here. There is a similar oxy, uh, sodium in the cube, which is behind this, okay? Then there is a similar oxygen in the cube, which is on the left-hand side, and a similar oxygen, which is at the back left-hand side. This makes it four uh, sodium. 
and similar for above in these posi positions. So the coordination number of sodium is four and the coordination number of oxide is eight. This is how we visualize the coordination number of the corner atom in the antifluoride structure, okay? Now, if I want to describe it as a space filling polyhedra, so what do I say? You can imagine it as a 3D network of edge sharing tetrahedra NaO4. This Na is at the center, it is forming a tetrahedra and since all the eight octanes are filled, these tetrahedra are sharing edges, okay? Or in other words, your ONA8 cube are sharing corners. See, why it is sharing corner? I am going a little extra mile to make you uh, visualize this particular thing. Uh, if you can uh, imagine this edge center at the back, there is no uh, oxygen here, right? So what happens is, if you try to make a similar cube here, which you made here, that cube would be empty. Basically, there is nothing. So you have, but there is a cube in the center also. So this cube and the cube at the corner, which we just described are sharing corners, okay? Similarly, try to imagine all uh, the cubes around all the oxide ion and you will be able to visualize that these are corners sharing ONA8 cube or 3D network of edge sharing tetrahedra NaO4. This is how we can explain the structure. And this structure is of course adopted by the compounds such as lithium oxide, which of course, uh, will do the same as Na2O, lithium selenide, sodium sulfide, A2O, etc. Fluoride structure. Anybody who has done even a bit of solid state chemistry will know what a fluoride structure is because this is the most common structure. I would rather say the most common. In fact, the people like us who work in BRC in nuclear industry, fluoride structure is very important because this is the structure that is adopted by our nuclear fuels. UO2, PUO2, okay, THO2. So, fluoride structure is nothing, but whatever you just studied in anti fluoride structure, now just that your calcium ion, your cation is forming closed CCP or FCC, whatever way you want to describe it as, and your fluoride is occupying all the tetrahedral holes, okay. Now, why do I say that in this particular case, uh, calcium uh, uh, adopts the FCC lattice? If you remember, I told you that the smaller ion will go into the voids, okay? Because the voids will definitely be smaller than the balls that are forming those voids. Now, in case of Na2O, oxide was a bigger ion. In case of CaF2, fluoride is a very small ion. And that is the result. Calcium, we, uh, Rohit, there's somebody waiting. Calcium adopts the, uh, makes the CCP and fluoride occupies a tetrahedral hole, okay? Everything else, of course, we know I'm not able to lose, okay. Now, till now, whatever structure we studied, that is your NaCl, that is your zinc blend, that is your fluoride, anti-fluoride, there, those were the structure with CCP, cubic close packing. Now, I will talk about the structures with hexagonal close packing. In that also coming back to, coming to the AX type, where your stoichiometry of metal, cation to anion is one is to one. The very first example is nickel arsenide, okay? So let me first go through the basic, basic things. It is the hexagonal close pack analog of rock salt structure. When do I, when I say analog means it forms uh, HCP of arsenic, and like in NaCl, your cation occupied the octahedral hole in the CCP packing. Here, your nickel ion occupies the octahedral hole in the hexagonal close packing. Okay. Coordination number, it is nickel is to arsenic. The stoichiometry is one. The coordination number has to be same. Nickel is occupying the octahedral hole. Octahedral hole means six neighbors. So, coordination number of both nickel and arsenic are six. Now, what is the difference here? between NaCl and NiAs. I'll show you the picture as well, but just to mention it, in NaCl, I could describe it as CCP of Na, Cl occupying octahedral, or CCP of Cl and Na occupying octahedral. Here, it is HCP of As, 
nickel occupying octahedral but i cannot describe it vice versa the reason is the polyhedra there the polyhedra was octahedral whichever i you consider na or cl here if you are putting nickel in the octahedral hole the six arsenic that are surrounding it are arranged in an octahedral manner but if you concentrate on arsenic the coordination number of arsenic is also six but the nickel are in the form of a trigonal prism how do these two shapes uh, differ uh, see in case of an octahedra if uh, you have three anions three anions and they are staggered in case of a trigonal biprism it is they are eclipsed like the two anions three anions they would be like exactly above each other okay so the difference is in case of nacl both na and cl have got octahedral uh, polyhedra in case of nickel arsenide nickel has got uh, octahedral polyhedra but the arsenic has got trigonal prismatic polyhedra okay so this is how uh, you can visualize the structure this is your hexagonal closed pack uh, cell the blue color are the arsenic that are forming hcp and nickel is occupying the octahedral hole so where are the octahedral hole okay so these are your six arsenic in the b layer these are your uh, three arsenic in the b layer these are six in the a layer this is the octahedral hole okay the uh, octahedral hole above this is lined here so as you can imagine that octahedral holes they lie exactly above each other that is why whatever arsenic these are surrounding that arsenic will have a trigonal prismatic geometry like this this and this is a trigonal prismatic geometry okay all right again to show you more clearly this is how the asni6 polyhedra looks like and this is how the ni as6 polyhedra looks like so in this case whereas in case of nacl it was easier to interchange them it was okay to interchange them in nickel arsenide we really cannot interchange once we describe what is an octahedral hole it has to be in the octahedral hole and the other would form the hcp woodside structure it is similar to your uh, it is the hcp analog of zinc blend structure in zinc blend structure either zinc or sulfide most conventionally we say sulfide form the ccp zinc occupied the tetrahedral hole in this case hcp of sulfide and the zinc occupies the tetrahedral hole and okay uh, last time i was not able to show you the tetrahedral hole in this figure i try to show it to you now first imagine this is all sulfur which are forming ccp the open boxes are z okay these are the open tetrahedral hole so where are the tetrahedral hole see this is the a layer of sulfide this is the b layer of sulfide and this is again the a layer of sulfide okay and now if you imagine these three of b and this this is your tetrahedral hole similarly this is your tetrahedral hole now where are other two tetrahedral holes so if you see imagine this ion and these three which are lying in the three uh, two to uh, hexagonal unit cell these centered and now if i try to join this okay this is your tetrahedral hole similarly this is the tetrahedral hole okay so two tetrahedra pointing upwards two tetrahedra pointing downwards so this is uh, what i wanted to show you yesterday and we'll come back to it in the end of the class because i would also want to tell you the coordinates of these particular tetrahedra hole which are of course not very important for you to remember but it is a good exercise to do so that you can have a very clear idea of how to mark the holes okay that's again the same thing now uh, some i will talk about uh, those were the very basic structure which every solid state chemistry student is taught where whenever you start solid state chemistry some commonly known compound which you hear about regularly but the structures uh, you most probably don't know about but 
they are also based on these kind of pattern but they are slightly different because they are distorted how are they distorted titania i'm sure half of the researchers who are working in material science would have worked with titania at some time in their career it is such a versatile material but what is the structure of titania okay so what it forms it forms a hexagonal close packing of oxygen but of course it is slightly distorted okay and your titanium occupies half the octahedral side now how does that half occupy that is something i would want to show you okay if uh, you can imagine this all right so these are three this is a layer of octahedral hole right this is another layer of octahedral hole but how in case of titania they are they are occupied this row uh, let's say assume now this is a layer but if i continue it backwards this particular layer of uh, octahedral hole because they will be lying one after other it will be a row similarly this will be a row and this will be a row so one row is occupied second row is vacant third row is occupied fourth row is vacant that is how we get the stoichiometry of titanium oxide why because oxygen is forming hcp then we have uh, for every oxygen we have two octahedral hole but only half of them are occupied so the stoichiometry is 1 is to 2 all right so uh, this structure uh, in terms of phase sharing uh, in terms of uh, space filled polyhedra we can describe as your edge sharing titanium tio6 infinite chains which are parallel to c axis and then they link their corners to form 3d network if you don't understand it it is totally fine because these things take some time for you to visualize okay now cdi2 it is if i describe it it is similar to what i described for titania but there is one very big difference you know cdi2 is the distorted hexagonal close packing of iodine similar to tio2 where oxide had that hexagonal close packing again here cd2 plus occupy half the octahedral side but now what is the difference the difference is now here these layers are occupied in the sense this particular layer would be occupied this would be unoccupied the one below would be occupied below it will be unoccupied so now what you have is the octahedra are linked in one layer but they are not linked in the other layer so what you have that is a very very important reason by cdi2 is actually okay so it is defined as let me first come to this edge sharing tio6 infinite layer which are parallel to ab plane but the important thing is that these two layers while in one layer where the octahedral are uh, fixed they are connected by covalent bond but with the next layer because in between now you do not have any ion they are held together by van der waals forces van der waals forces are weak forces and that is the reason cdi2 layer can easily slide over one another in fact the structures like cdi2 are very very important why because you can intercalate whatever you want in the empty layers you can generate a new material so this is how when we say the structure manifests into properties all right we'll take some even better example wherein we relate structure to the property coming to cdcl2 in the similar way it is uh, cdi2 was the hcp of iod iodide cdcl2 is a ccp of chloride and your cadmium ion occupy half the octahedral side similarly alternate layers are occupied not the rows like tio2 okay and this structure is adopted by cl2 so hence br2 zinc br2 and nicl2 okay now uh, coming to silicate structure what is silica if you touch uh, if you go to the sea beach the sand uh, there, there is silica it's nothing but sio2 you know probably this is the most common material that we encounter around us uh, silica is just one form of silicate structure there are n number plethora of silicate structure that exists that we know of and how are these structures different it is entirely a complete field of crystallography that concerns silica silicate their structures but i will only give you a little glimpse of 
how the silica uh, and silicate they adopt the particular structure that is given to them. Okay. So what are silicate man minerals? They are salt-like material with metal cation and various type of silicate ions. One thing that you have to remember is that in case the guideline is silicon atom and silicate is tetragonally coordinated by oxygen atom. It is always the SiO4 tetrahedra, whatever silicate mineral you have. Okay. So all of them are based on uh, SiO4 tetrahedra. Okay, now these SiO4, they always share corner, okay? And one corner is never shared by more than two tetrahedra. And you have to remember, uh, I think Rohit, you have shared share kiya hai hai. But he can manage me baad mein ki. So one thing that you have to remember is that two SiO4 tetrahedra, they will never ever share edges or faces. And let us talk about this. Why is it so? In fact, believe me, uh, SiO4, in SiO4, Si is 4 plus, okay? If you have cations like tungsten 6 plus, moly 6 plus, arsenic 5 plus, these polyhedra will always avoid to form structure wherein their polyhedra have to share either edges or faces. The reason is, See, when two polyhedra are joined together only by a corner, they have a certain distance between them, right? Now, suppose they share edge. When they share edge, the cation will come closer. When they share faces, the cation will become even closer, right? And these are highly charged cation, 4 plus, 5 plus, 6 plus. That will be a very, very unstable situation for them. That is the reason. In all the silicate minerals that you would encounter around you, in their structure, the SiO4 tetrahedra will always share corner and never edges and faces. Okay. So then how do the structures differ? differ? Okay. The thing is, uh, they differ in the variety of the ways that these SiO4 tetrahedra link together. They may form chains, they may form rings, they may form sheets, or they may form the three-dimensional network in our usual SiO2, okay? And the way they link, it decides the silicate anion. Then they may have bridging or non-bridging oxygen. What do I mean by bridging and non-bridging? When two SiO4 polyhedra are sharing one corner, they are bridging, but that particular oxygen that they're sharing is the bridging oxygen. The other three in both, which are not being shared, are non-bridging. And then the structures are classified based on the silicate anion. Let us see how. Okay. So what happens is whenever you are asked to tell, okay, what is a silicate anion that is present in the structure or what could be the structure of the SiO unit in that particular mineral that is given to you. So you have to see that the structure of the silicate anion depends upon silicon to oxygen ratio. It can have, silicate structure can have two types of oxygen, non-bridging and bridging. When it is non-bridging, in the formula, you will count it as one. When it is bridging, because it is being shared between two silica, silicon, you will count it as 0.5, okay? Now, let us see what happens. When your Si2O ratio is one is to four, okay? What you have is four non-bridging anions, and in your structure, silica would exist as Si, isolated SiO4 tetrahedra. Okay, and its anion is SiO4, 4 minus. Why 4 minus? Si is 4 plus, 1 oxygen is 2 minus, 4 oxygen are 8 minus, plus 4 minus 8 minus 4. And the examples are Mg2Si4, Li4Si4. Now, if, you, if I give you Mg2Si4 as a formula, and I ask you, what could be the silicate anion in this? What could be the linkages? You simply have to see what is the ratio of oxygen to silicon. It is 1 is to 4. That means they are isolated SiO4 tetrahedra. If the ratio is 1 is to 3.5, it has, because we have a 3 as a whole number, so there are 3 non-bridging oxygen and 1 bridging oxygen which is contributing 0 0.5. 3 into 1 plus 1 into 0 0.5, 3.5. That means... Now your silica, there are two SiO4 tetrahedra which are sharing one corner, like this. Okay, and the charge becomes 
the anion is si2 and now you have seven oxygen one two three four five six seven so si2 o7 and the charge is six minus okay these are dimers so this examples are rankinite and thortvitite which is scandium silicate if the si2 o ratio is one is to three one is to three means two bridging two into one and two non bridging two into 0.5 so two plus one three so these can form chains okay or rings i will show you on the next slide these are the rings these are the chains okay and then examples are sodium silicate ni2so sio3 calcium silicate and beryl okay if it is 1 is to 2.5 it is Three bridging, one non-bridging, and these are infinite two-dimensional sheets. That is, each silica uh, is sharing three of its oxygen, and only one oxygen belongs completely to its own polyhedra. One is to two means now all the four are bridging, which is our famous SiO two structure. So what is happening is silica four oxygen. This each oxygen is actually shared by one more SiO four tetrahedra. So you get a three D framework. these are this is your isolated tetrahedral this is a dimer this is ring this is sheet this is infinite uh, double sheets uh, sorry this is infinite double sheet and these are your three dimensional network okay so just another example which i have already told you suppose i give you uh, ca2mg si2o7 and i tell you ask you what could be the anion the ratio is 7 is to 2 You have one is to three point five. Three point five means it is a silica dimer. Okay. Sometimes you could have a compound like Na two Si three O seven. Here the ratio is one is to two point three three. That falls between two and two point five. That means when it was two, then all the four were shared. When it was two point five, there was one which was non-bridging. That means some of the Si O four have got all of these shared, and some of them have got. one non bridging anion so this is how by the glass of course you'll have to do a lot of study xrd refinement to see what is the exact structure but this is at a glance how you can visualize what could the structure be okay so uh, this was actually the first lecture which we should have covered in the last class so till now we studied very very basic things basic building blocks of crystal chemistry what are unit cell what are seven different shapes of unit cell which we also call as crystal system what are the basic lattice type what are bevis lattice planes and directions understanding the structure or based on the close packing of hard spheres and then some common ax and ax2 type structure based on both the cubic close packing and hexagonal close packing we also talked about the structure of silicate okay so we'll now move to the second lecture you can take a 2 minutes break any doubt please type in the chat section and then now we'll talk about some of the factors which influence your crystal structure volume on me any doubts anything that you would want to mention
शेयर करेंगे रोहित अभी Okay, so uh, starting with uh, something that is, you know, will help us understand the, this topic more. So, what are the factors that influence a crystal structure? What decides that? Uh, of course, every structure has a specific thing which is particularly specific to that particular structure uh, for a compound to adopt it. But there are certain general factors. Okay, and they. To be very honest, uh, they are uh, more of general uh, understanding and, you know, general wisdom. Okay, if this happens, then this structure should be followed. So, first and foremost is, that goes without saying this formula of the compound. Okay, if your formula is like AX, it cannot adopt a fluoride structure. Okay, when you do, uh, mm, uh, let's say, higher solid state chemistry, then you may realize, okay, some vacancies can occur. And maybe, but it would never be to the extent of that an AX can adopt an AX2 structure. So it depends upon the formula of the compound and the formula depends upon the valency. So what we want to say is the stoichiometry also, that is the first general and a very general wisdom kind of uh, factor that the stoichiometry will decide the structure. Then bonding, you know, whether the anions that are involved in the compound have more of uh, their uh, have more affinity like more of the ionic bond kind of material elect, uh, do they have more preference for electrostatic attraction or they would want to form the covalent bond this particular factor also affects what structure your material would adopt in general your uh, ccp is preferred by uh, the compounds which have more of ionic bonding and HCP is more of covalent bonding, but again a generalization, but then the factors that we are discussing are more of general factors only. Okay, size of atoms and ions, you know, uh, sizes means, uh, let's say, okay, first we'll talk about this particular factor, radius ratio. All of you know that we say that, we'll talk about that also in one particular slide, but what is the relative radius of cation and anion that will decide what would be the structure? Because let's say, for example, an ion is forming CCP, then depending upon tetrahedral hole will always be smaller than octahedral hole. Then how big is the cation relative to your anion, which is forming that CCP, will decide whether it will go to tetrahedral or octahedral. Okay, just one example. So it depends upon the relative sizes of cation and anion. But in many of the cases, you know, even if uh, now, so if I want to get a ratio, let's say uh, two of cation to anion, a very hypothetical case. Four by two is also two and eight by four is also two, right? So it depends upon the radius ratio, that is the relative sizes, but it also depends upon the absolute sizes of atoms and ions. So for example, uh, I'll give you a very brief example of one of the class of compound that I work upon is Vix by I, which has A2O3 kind of um, uh, structure. Now, if both A and O is of course bigger, oxide ion is relatively, uh, you know, it's reasonably big. If this A is also a bigger anion, bigger cation, it forms a structure which we call as Bix by I. You don't need to know, but just telling you. But if A is a smaller cation, and in case of oxygen, I have some other anion which is also smaller, they go to the structure which is called ilmenite despite the fact that the radius ratios are also similar. So what are the factors that we just talked about? Stoichiometry of the cation and anion, relative sizes of the cation and anion, absolute sizes of the cation and anion, and the bonding between them, whether they are more covalent type or the more electrostatic type, okay? Just discussing each of these factors in detail, uh, how would uh, the structure and the coordination will differ if your formula of the compound is AXBY, then always remember 
because what is the coordination number of your cation and anion is also an important part in deciding what the structure is. So, if your formula is AxBy, the coordination of A and B will be in the ratio Y by X. For example, if you have AB2, the coordination number of A would be and 2B would be in the ratio 2 is to 1, that is inverse. Your example, we just studied the fluoride structure, calcium fluoride. Okay, the coordination number of fluoride is 4 and calcium is 8, okay, which is inverse of their stoichiometry, right? We'll not go to the complex uh, formula that is given downstairs uh, in the bottom section. Nature of the bonding. So, without going into all this, uh, nature of the bonding, how does it affect this? See, when you have a uh, compounds or ions that prefer to form electrostatic bond. That means they are more ionic. They have a lot of charge. So when they have charge, uh, electrostatic force of attraction kind of gives them the stability. That is the reason they would want to adopt or accommodate as many anions around them as possible. But this will depend on their size. Okay. Now, the fact that they would want to accommodate as many anions around them as possible, plus they would also want to be as far away as possible from the ions of the similar charge. This kind of gives uh, the geometry that they form very, very symmetrical structures. Okay. They and they also tend to adopt coordination as high as possible because higher is the coordination. Bonds and more is their stability uh, because this maximizes their electrostatic force of attraction. But they will all, of course, uh, what they can take, it's not that a very small ion can take eight uh, anions uh, around it. So there has to be, it again depends upon its size. But given its size, it will tend to adopt coordination number as high as possible. Whereas in case of covalent solids, you know, they do not like a lot of crowding because those bonds are very strong. They're very directional and atoms generally prefer to have smaller coordination number. They'll be linear, they'll be triangular. They will not have eight, seven, nine, those kind of coordination number will not occur in the solids which have more covalent contribution. Just giving you one example, barium oxide and strontium oxide. Now, we know barium and strontium, they belong to the second group. They're alkaline or 2 plus, highly electropositive, tend to form ionic bond. These are ionic. They adopt the rock salt structure, which is your NaCl structure. Coordination number is 6. Now, based on the size consideration, mercury size is not very different from barium and strontium. It could have adopted rock salt too. But mercury has more tendency to form covalent bond so, it forms linear OHEO segments in its structure, okay? Coming to another series, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, we know are halogen. With aluminium, they form trivalent compound ALF3, ALCL3, ALBR3, ALIA3. Now, as your size of anion is increasing from fluoride to iodide, the covalent character increases, you know? The Chotu, the smaller ion will have more charge, more electrostatic attraction. So the covalent character re relatively increases. How does this affect your structure? ALF3 is a high melting crystalline solids. We have not talked about REO3 structure, but it is a very symmetrical solid and a very famous structure. ALCL3 forms layered structure. Now it is not connected very strongly in all the three dimension like ALF3. It is partly ionic, partly covalent. CdCl2, if you remember, Cl forms the CCP and Cd occupies half of the octahedral layer wise. All right. On the contrary, if I move to the other bigger ion, bromine and iodine, they are molecular solids. They do not form three dimensional or even heat structure. They are molecular solid with Al2 X6 units. Okay. So this is the how. The covalency as well as the size, they affect the nature of bonding. Uh, these affect your crystal structure, the preference for the crystal structure. Okay. Effect of size. Okay. Uh, 
this is uh, mostly uh, what I described you in the previous uh, this thing. The coordination number for ionic solid. Now we're talking about the ionic solid. Coordination number can be as large as possible, as long as this is another important factor that creeps in now. The ion is in contact with the neighboring ions. Why? It maximizes attraction. Second part is the light charges tend to be as far apart as possible. Okay. And both these two combined, A and B, imply that your ionic solids have got highly symmetrical structure. Okay. For covalent solid, the covalent radii, uh, okay, that is the next thing about radius. Right? So, when to, okay, one point that I would like to emphasize is what do I mean when I say that as long as cation is in contact with neighboring ions? Okay, look at this particular structure. These are your, the center one is the cation, surrounding one are the anions. This is allowed, stable. This is allowed, stable. But when your cation becomes very smaller than the, like much smaller than the site that it is occupying, it tends to rattle, you know, and that rattling situation is highly unstable. That is why we have got radius ratio. We have got a range in which that particular void can be occupied. Okay. So, uh, in case of ionic structure, as you talked about it, the coordination number will be determined by electrostatic attraction. If the size of the cation is big enough that it can take six anion by touching all of them, it will not take four. It will take, it will tend to be surrounded by as many anions possible and vice versa because it maximizes electrostatic attraction and it maximizes lattice energies. We'll talk about lattice energy just in a few minutes. Radius ratio rules. Why radius ratio rule come into picture? As your cation keeps on increasing, it can pack more and more anions around it. The only guideline is it should always be in touch with the anions. That sets the lower limit, okay? Because if it is smaller than the anions and it cannot no more touch them, then it starts rattling and it becomes unstable. Anions may or may not touch each other that we saw. Here the anions are touching each other, here they are not. So that is totally fine. So with these guidelines, we can actually set up the range of the radius ratio that is required for the particular coordination number. Coordination number means how many anions the cation can accommodate around it. Okay. So radius ratio generally is the radius of the smaller ion by radius of larger ion. And that is why, in general, if you see the books, they will define it as radius of cation by radius of anion because cation is generally the smaller one. Okay. So, what are the ideal radius ratio rules for different coordination numbers? All of you have done this, but just for the sake of revision, if your cation to anion lies in this range, you can accommodate three anions. As it crosses this particular range, it feels happy that maybe I can accommodate one more anion. It will maximize my electrostatic attraction and it can occupy four ions. And as I told you, four could be square planar, four could be anything, but it will take tetrahedra because it tries to make, get the most symmetric arrangement. As I tell you, the ionic solids tend to be more symmetric. Till 4.414, it follows this. Beyond that, it feels I can accommodate more anion and then it takes octahedra. Okay. Beyond that, it again feels I can accommodate much more, uh, many more anions. It takes cubic. And we reach one where your radius to cation and anion is then equal. Now, if you ask me, why not beyond one? If it is beyond one, we are back to this particular situation. Now, what we said, the radius ratio is R small by R large. It's just that now the situation would be reversed. Your cation would form the close packing and the anion will fill in the hole. Is that okay? Okay. Now, I want to ask one thing. We went from 3 to 4, from 4 to 6 and 6 to 8. Coordination number 5 and 7 were absent. Okay. So, what could be the reason behind it? The reason is... When I'm joining my cation to anion in whatever geometry, octahedra, 
tetrahedra cubic i'm forming bond between cation and anion and in this particular case we are not talking about a particular compound any specific compound these bonds are equal okay when you try to pack five balls around the cation or seven balls around the cation that is when you are talking of uh, we are talking of close pack structure here with five and seven you cannot form the space filling uh, structures what i mean to say is uh, either you will have to you know increase or decrease the bond length so that the entire space can be filled i'll give you a very very uh, simple uh, analogy uh do you see on the floor the tiles are uh, filled up the tiles are either uh square they are hexagonal but they are never five coordinated tiles okay if they are five coordinated then the sides of the tiles would not be similar because with those five you will there will be empty spaces you will not be able to fill up the entire space okay so that is the reason coordination number 5 and 7 they are possible sometimes in two dimension but three dimensional face pillar this this is what i was trying to tell you i didn't know i had this slide with me in close pack structure if you keep all cation and anion bond length constant that is a criteria you will never be able to fill up the space this empty space will always exist okay so if it occurs at all the structure would be distorted that is the bond lengths will not be constant okay i hope it is clear so this is uh, just the example of uh, here the coordination number is 0.1 so it is a linear molecule 0.324 uh, this is 0.73 it is coordination number 6 and 8 now what happens to the coordination number which lie on the border line okay we described some limits as this but there cannot be any limits can i measure the ionic radii accurately i cannot so how can i define a radius ratio up to three places of tesselin okay so there have to be some anomalies let's talk about those anomalies okay so what are the limitations of the radius ratio limitation of the radius ratio is first and foremost we have to uh, accept that ionic radii also will depend upon varying depend will vary depending on the source where you have taken that ionic radii from is it from the pauling's value or is it from some other value because you know the calculation method differ and because we have defined such specific limits so even a here and there of the ionic radii value will change the radius ratio that is the reason radius ratio uh, rules are simply the guidelines okay so many a times different coordination number could be predicted let's say for example rubidium iodide this is not r oxide this is r iodide if i take the radius ratio radius of iodide as this if i take the radius of iodide as this my radius ratio changes and this places it in two different categories this is cubic and this is octahedral right so this is a limitation and ionic radii also are the function of coordination number and bonding those of you who are doing research please or just google it. there is something called rd shannon's database of ionic radii okay and you click it will show you the periodic table click on any atom that you want to see lanthanum yttrium sodium whatever you want to see if you will see for every ion there is a particular table you know it tells the ionic radii of whatever oxidation state the ion is possible in for example if i talk about manganese it will give you the ionic radii of mn2 plus mn3 plus mn4 plus 5 plus 6 plus also depending upon the coordination number like mn3 plus in 6 fold and 8 fold why because the ionic radii are calculated this way what they will do is okay imagine i have a cation here i have four anions around it and imagine the distance between cation and anion now imagine eight anions around it now think about the distance between cation and anion when you have eight anion this distance will be longer as compared to four okay and how are ionic radii most of the time calculated we determine the electron density by x ray crystallography or some method and then we try to divide it half okay now when the coordination number was four this distance was smaller so the ionic radii would be smaller of the same ion i'm talking about but when this distance was longer and i do it half it will be longer right so it depends upon the coordination number plus 
when your ion is forming a covalent bonding that bond would be stronger it will be smaller if it is ionic it will be relatively longer of course these differences will not be too much why i am telling you all these things is because i am using these radii to calculate radius ratio and that is why we say that radius ratio are the guideline okay also even if let's say i am following only one particular source of ionic radii radii what happens to the structure radius ratio which are borderline between 4 and 6 between 6 and 8 very interesting if such cases happen then these kind of compound have the tendency to show polymorphism that with they will they can equally adopt two structure in which my cation can occupy two or three coordination two coordination number depending upon the borderline of to which two radius ratio it was falling on for example germanium oxide exhibit silica like structure where coordination number is 4 and rutile rutile is your tio2 where coordination number is 6 also sometimes they adopt the distort for example if a for a particular anion the radius ratio was on the borderline of 4 and 6 it happens for vanadium in bo2 what happens is it forms an octahedra but one of the bond is highly elongated so actually to tell that it is in the coordination number of vanadium is very difficult so what we say it has a square parameter 4 and 5 above so the coordination number is that is i told you when we talk about five coordination number or something like this those are all very distorted structures right okay so just some example to give you a flavor of why we say that the radius ratio are very important because you know at glance when we do the data analysis we first try to analyze generally and then we going to specific so that way radius ratio are very very important because they give you a broad flavor of the things but to specify a particular thing of course you cannot really rely them to third place of decimal fourth place of decimal because they are guidelines because of the uh, nature of the values that we use in it okay these are some exercises i'll tell you about one and you can probably do as a homework for uh, other how to calculate r plus by r minus let's say for the trigonal simple you consider uh, the small cation in the center and three anions and abc are the center of those anions okay now ab is equal to bc is equal to ac because i'm talking of hard sphere similar radius ratio and so forth and so on now this particular angle is 60 which implies this angle is 30 okay now uh, if i mark this center point as o which is the center of my cation then my o uh, cos 30 will be uh, let's say be upon ob okay and what is your be nothing but r minus what is your ob nothing but r minus plus r plus isn't it so once you get something like this this formula and you substitute this you will get r plus by r minus you take it here cos 30 comes in the denominator r minus by cos 30 All right, value of cos thirty is this. Take the reciprocal. So R plus plus R minus is one point one five five of R minus. Take R minus here, you get something like this. Bring R minus here, you will get the radius ratio of point one five five. That is, this is the smallest value which your cation should have to accommodate three anions around it. All right. i hope these slides uh, would be shared with you so you can uh, you don't really need to note down each thing uh, step by step just to give you an idea same way you can calculate for tetrahedral similar just that now this particular angle we know the b ion is lying on the top. what is a tetrahedra a triangle at the bottom and one ion on the top so b ion this angle b c b a is now tetrahedral angle which is 109 degree 28 minutes so we can now half it and similarly we can take this as r minus and bd as r minus plus r plus and do the similar step all right i'll pause for a minute you can take a look at it take a look at this derivation 
uh, and not a derivation. So simple maths. We just need to know the starting point, like how we used to do in the geometry when we were in school. So it's as simple as that. Okay. Similarly, for coordination number six, uh, you don't need to assume the top and the bottom sphere. You can, uh, what is an octahedra? Coordination number six, we can imagine in two ways, either two triangles, which are staggered or a square in one plane, one circle, one sphere at the top and one at the bottom, in between we have octahedral hole. So just imagine that square and you can do in the similar way. Here your angle would be 90, half it, it will be 45. You take cosine and then you can reach R plus pi, R minus. Okay, now talking about the lattice energy, which is, uh, we'll take a break for a minute, please, so that I can have some water and you also try to recall it till now, whatever we have talked about, all right? Any doubt, chat box, please. For for cubic cubic I have not done I forgot to insert that slide but I'll get it next time. Is there anything which is not clear? Of course, we have been doing simple things. So, but your doubts are very welcome. I hope our mail IDs have been circulated to you. So if you have any doubt regarding whatever has been taught or, you know, in general, even after the course is over regarding solid state chemistry or anything that you would want to know about structural crystal chemistry, you're most welcome to mail me or any of the other lecturers. Okay, so uh, lattice energy of the crystal structure. Okay, so what is the lattice energy? It's nothing, but uh, what would be the potential energy? What are basically you're doing when you're forming crystal? You're bringing point charges together in some arrangement, depending upon the factors that we discussed a uh, few minutes back. And what would be the potential energy of that particular arrangement of charges that form that structure, okay? So in nutshell, it is like, uh, suppose they were gaseous ion, and I brought them together in the arrangement in a particular pattern that I want, of course, 
the crystal structure, then what is the energy? You know, uh, that is called the crystal uh, lattice energy. Basically, by definition, it is the energy required to sublime the crystal into gaseous ion per mole. If I'm talking of molar lattice energy. See, uh, we will talk about all these structure and how it depends upon these structure. But if you just sit uh, and think about it, that if you really have to break something, what would it depend upon? It would depend upon how hard your material is, which will also depend upon what your crystal structure is, right? Then you're trying to separate two entities. Uh, that will depend upon how strongly they're born. And that would depend upon what are the charges on them, right? Okay. And what is their internuclear separation? If they're already sitting lousily far apart, it is easier to separate them. Okay. So, uh, of course, we'll try to just uh, kind of uh, go through how the lattice energy formula comes up. It's a little bit complicated when you look at it. But ultimately, in the end, we will come to these factors soon. So, what I want to say here is, and in general, this is what I always tell the students is, solid state chemistry is a very, very interesting kind of field, you know. As a student, I would wonder why is it that this particular, uh, you know, uh, ion adopt this structure or it adopt this coordination number. But most of the time when you see, if you really do not go into formulas and all, if you understand the concept, you will be able to reason out without any formula, why is anything happening that is happening? That is the best part about this particular branch of chemistry. Because atoms and ions will behave as how the human beings will behave. Okay. So that is uh, how I try to relate to the things when I do. If you try to follow that approach, believe me, it's going to really make the things easy for you. So, okay. We will not derive the expression, but we will try to see what are the factors that contribute so that it makes the thing easier. It helps. Meanwhile, it will clear the concept. Okay. So, in principle, as I told you, what is the lattice energy is you have just brought the gaseous ions from somewhere which are oppositely charged and placed them in a particular pattern. Now, suppose there is a conglo, there is an agglomeration of Na ions and Cl ions and I'm bringing them together. Na's will repel each other, Cl, Cl will repel each other, but Na, Cl will attract each other. Okay. So, ultimately, this is a summation of all attractive and repulsive forces that you have to encounter while bringing them close, okay? So, if I say, those of you, if you can remember even the slightest of physics, for a pair of gaseous ion, which has charge Z plus, Z minus, and separated by a distance R naught, these are, of course, the factor, if you know, remember, fine, but this is electronic charge, and this is your dielectric permittive, uh, this thing, and these are, of course, the constant. This is the potential energy of a pair of gaseous ion I'm trying to bring closer. If these, it is negative, when you're talking about the oppositely charged ion, it is positive when you're talking about the light charged ion, okay? Now, so what we can do is we can try to see what all factors come in arising from repulsion and attraction for one particular ion, we concentrate on only one ion. And then we scale up to the mole of uh, mole of the ion pair. And we see we should be able to equate it to the lattice energy. Okay. Now this is your rock salt structure. Okay. Assuming Na is at the body center. Of course, as I just talked about NaCl, we can talk interchangeably. But right now I'm talking about Na Cl forming the CCP and Na at the octahedral hole. Where are the octahedral hole? Body center and edge centers. Okay. So just concentrate on this body centered NA. How many uh, CL it has? The neighboring, the first neighbors are 6 CL. Where are those 6 CL? At the face center. This, 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 and this. Okay. Other than that, what are the next neighbors? The next neighbor are 12 light charged. Sodium ions. Where are they? 1, 2, 3, 4, basically all the edge centers. Further than this, again, oppositely charged 8 chloride ion, which are at the corner of the cube. Alright? This. So, 
And what it means is I have six CL minus, let's say at the distance of R naught. If once I have defined R naught, I will be able to define other distance also. Then I have 12 NA at the distance of root 2 R naught, 8 CL, root 3 R naught. Further, 6 NA plus means uh, you imagine uh, these cube has six faces. Imagine six cubes on each of the face. NA plus at their center, those are the next uh, 6 NA plus, then 24 chloride and so on and so forth, right? Okay. So the total attractive energy will be, this will be attractive, okay? Uh, this will be repulsive, this will be attractive, repulsive and so on. And if you remember this formula, okay, uh, R naught here would be, uh, I can uh, actually write this as, and then each of these potential energy term will be multiplied by how many, so for example, when I'm calculating the attraction energy for this particular sodium and uh, let's say uh, for this particular sodium and this chloride, it is one. Similarly, there are six. So I have to multiply by six. Okay. So if I do all this for this, I get a term wherein I put it in this value, value of R naught. I will take this outside because this particular factor would be common. What I will have is the number of the ions that are multiplying it, whether six, eight, 12, and this R naught value. So I can take this outside the bracket, what I will have is 6, 12 by root 2, 8 by root 3, 6 by root 4, 24 by root 5 and so on. This factor is called the Maedlung constant M. And because in determining this distances, what did I imagine? I imagined it was a rock salt structure wherein the positions were defined. That means for a particular crystal structure, whether it is NACL, KCL, LICL, whatever, MGO or BAO, SRO, whichever is adopting the oxal structure, the Maedlung constant will be same, okay? Because it depends upon ultimately the structure. That is how many number of cations or anions are there at a particular distance from the ions of my concern, okay? So, uh, then this become, this formula becomes, uh, and then I have multi, this was for one ion, I, I have n number of ions this way, ion pair. So this is, I multiply it by n, and I replace that lumba wala, uh, that uh, big mathematical expression by m. So I have n m z plus z minus and whatever you see here, okay? So again repeating, m Maedlung constant depends upon the geometrical arrangement of the charges. And what is the geometrical arrangement of charge? The crystal structure that I'm talking about. So once whatever compound you are taking, if it is adopting same crystal structure, Maedlung constant would be same. Other than that, even if your unlike charges are coming together, for example, Na and Ca, they have attractive force, but both of them have electron clouds and electrons have similar charge, right? So there would also be a repulsive force between the electron clouds as they come near each other. And that repulsive energy is given by this particular uh, expression where N is of course the number of ion, D is a constant and N is something which is called as Born exponent and its value is 5 to 10. See, that is I told you, we are really not deriving this formula because we are not deriving these particular values, just an idea. So now the total energy is the sum of this attractive energy and some of this repulsive energy. So it comes out to be this, okay? Now you remember your potential energy curve. Okay? At this particular point, this potential energy is U. At this particular point, del U by del R should be zero because there is no change in the slope, right? When I do that, I get something like I derive, I differentiate it with respect to R and I equate it to zero. I get this. From this, I can determine the value of B, Born exponent, okay? Now this B, you put in this particular formula. You don't need to do this, you'll get the slides. Ultimately, what you will get is this thing, okay? Now, this is a constant, N is a Born uh, exponent, it is constant. This is the number of moles, basically, again, a constant. That means your lattice energy will depend upon M 
which depends on crystal structure, charge of cation and anion, okay, and the distance between them. We're good. So repeating it, it will depend upon Maitland constant that depends on crystal structure, charges on the ion, and the distance between the ions. Okay, so U depends upon M. N, if I'm assuming one mole, then N also becomes constant. R, Z, and Z minus. So for a particular ion, now, again narrowing, for a particular ionic structure, if I'm talking about one particular ion structure, then my M also is constant. For example, I'm comparing NaCl and KCl. Then my variables are R and the charges on the ion. Charges are more important than R because they appear as a multiplication group, right? Okay, now let us do some uh, example. For the same crystal structure, okay, let's say I'm assuming NaCl and NGO, both of them crystallize in rock salt structure. Tyvel and tyne, that is Mg2 plus O2 minus, would have higher lattice energy, which is four times than the compound with monovalent tyne. So this is 1 into 1 and this is 2 into 2. So whatever value you have, it will automatically be 4 times of this. Okay. It is not exactly 4 times because there are many other factors that come into play. But just as a rough approximation, you can totally think that it would be 4 times. Now, if Z are same, suppose I'm talking about uh, NaCl and KCl. Structure is same, Z is same. But K is bigger. So the distance between K and Cl will be more than Na and Cl. So more is the distance, lesser is your lattice energy. Okay. And what about melting point? See, ultimately, what is your lattice energy? How strong your lattice is held together? How strong your ions are held together? Stronger they are held together, more is the lattice energy and difficult to break them. Melting is also kind of breaking only, you know, taking them apart. Higher the lattice energy, more is the melting point. So MgO, CaO, BaO, similar structure, but the R is becoming uh, uh, more as you go from Mg to Ca to Ba, the lattice energies are decreasing. And as you can see, the melting point is also decreasing from 2800 to 1900, okay? So that was about lattice energy. So basically what we started in last 45 minutes or let's say 40 odd minutes, factors that affect the crystal structure, how the sizes as well as relative sizes of the constituting ion. Of course, we did not do how the sizes affect absolute size, but I'll try to take an example when we go to structure property relationship, but how relative sizes of the constituting ion, they dictate the crystal structure. It is nothing but radius ratio. Understanding contribution of different factors that lead to lattice energy and how the lattice energies are arrived at. Okay, so this was it. We can uh, wind up the lecture here. You can take up any doubts or anything else that you would want to say in terms of something that you would specifically want to study or, or, or anything else that you would want to say. Otherwise, I'm done from my side for today's lecture. What makes TIO2 to adopt different crystalline phases of its profile is so hard. Okay, Deepti, I'll see. Uh, if you remember, uh, if you have worked on titania, you would know that titania adopts different crystalline phases as the response to the temperature, right? Lutile, anatase. So basically, when you give it the, when you heat the material, uh, your bonds expand. And then the tendency of the cation to, and most of the time, we will study this particular thing in the phase transition. Your ion will, as it expands, it tends to go into a more symmetrical form. Okay. 
and when it tries to go into a more symmetrical form there are changes in the bond lengths and other factor that causes the phase transition and that is what happens to titanium okay anatase is a more symmetrical form as compared to rutile that is the effect of temperature on the crystal structure till now we were just studying about how the relative radius of uh, titanium and oxygen or cation and anion at a particular temperature let's say ambient temperature how would it affect then the phase changes also occur in uh, response to pressure changes because ultimately what pressure does as the temperature is trying to expand the pressure is trying to press it compress it it will also change the bond length in fact uh, high pressure phases are less symmetric why are they less symmetric because you know once they are compressing they are forcing more and more anions and then it will not take care of what is happening to symmetry and all so high pressure phases are less symmetrical have more coordination number and of course when they try to have more coordination number the symmetry changes and the phase changes of course anything else okay if uh, nothing else then maybe we can call it uh, the day today for our lecture and uh, i'll see you all on friday at 4:00 uh, o'clock usual time all right so good day to all of you and let's meet on friday now